Folks, today I've got a very, very simple message, just a message of salvation. It's a message of saved and sanctified to serve. And it really is a very, very simple, plain message. It's a message of salvation, it's of sanctification, and it's preparation to serve God, to do the ministry that God has prepared us to do. And you know, folks, these are things that we all know. This is not something we do not know. But you know something, I think it's sometimes good to go back to the basics and to look back at our life and to look at where we come from. Where were we when we were saved? Where are we now? Is our walk with God the walk we should be doing? To remember God's love to remember his mercy, to remember his grace. And in remembering that, to know that the very fact that we're here is because God has drawn us. You would not be here today if it was not that God had drawn you. And you know, probably the most beloved scripture in the whole of the Bible that everyone knows, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's the message of salvation, isn't it, folks? And that's the love of God. So what is salvation? You know, first of all, Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 9 says, it's by grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. And folks, you know what? The gift of God is free, but it's not cheap. Salvation is not something that is cheap, and we need to know that. Salvation does cost us. It costs us a surrender of our lives. It costs us giving the control of our lives to God Almighty, to our Savior. It's not us who are in control anymore. It's about giving up your rights. It's giving up your self-satisfaction, your self-indulgence, your self-whatever it is. It's putting God on the throne of your life. So it does cost us, even though it's free but it's not cheap and we need to remember that. It's not a sinner's prayer that you say and then you go and live your life the way you used to live it. It's a life that needs to be changed, guys, and this is what we need to know. Um, we're justified, we're declared righteous when we believe God and when we believe his promises. That's when we are declared righteous. We see this in the life of Abraham, you know, in Genesis 15 verse 6. Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. And we are declared righteous when we too believe God. So what is it that Abraham believed, folks? He believed God's promises, didn't he? And what is it that we need to believe God's promises? What had God promised? promised Abraham. First of all, he promised him a land. You know what? The land of Israel is the fulfillment of that promise, but it's only a tiny portion of what God has promised. The rest will be fulfilled, but it will be fulfilled in the millennial reign. Then he promised him a uh, um, descendants, as many as the stars in the sky. He also said as the dust of the earth later on. And folks, we know that the nation of Israel is the fulfillment of that promise. And then he promised him an heir. You know, Abraham was much too old to have children. Sarah was barren. There was no way she could have children. Yet Abraham, it says, believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And we know that that has been fulfilled. The heir is Jesus Christ, the one who crushes the head of the serpent. We know that that has been fulfilled. Folks, God is faithful to his promises. And that's what we need to understand. Okay, so now we have God's creation. When God created the universe, he knew that man would sin. He had a plan right from the very beginning, and we will see that plan. But you know, before God created life, he created everything that would sustain life. Then he created the birds of the uh, air, the uh, fish of the sea, and the beasts of the field. And when he did that, he saw that it was good. But then he created man, and he created man in the image of God. And when God created man, he saw that it was very good, no longer just good. But we know, folks, that man was going to fall, wasn't he? But God wants a personal one-to-one -one relationship with us. In the beginning, God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. God wanted that fellowship. That was why God created us, to glorify him and for fellowship us with him. That was God's plan of creation, wasn't it? Um, he gave man dominion to rule over all he had made. You know, folks, basically, God gave the title deed of the earth to, to Adam. And he said, right, you have the rule. You can rule over everything that I've made. And that was what Adam was going to do. 
but we know that Adam sinned, didn't he? And we know that he made a mess, but there was one command, only one command that God gave to them. He said, you can eat of all the trees in this garden, in this perfect garden that he had created. He said, but one tree you cannot eat from, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what did Adam do? Well, we know what Adam did. He disobeyed God, sin entered the world, isn't that so? And through, through sin um, came death. But Adam and Eve didn't die that day, did they? The process of spirit of physical death began, but it was spiritually that they died that day. And so they were separated from God. Guys, you all know this, but this is so important for us to look back, to remember the price that was paid for us, to remember what God has done. You know what? We are now born with a sin nature, aren't we? We've got the DNA of Adam. We don't want to sin, do we? But we do. And so God had this plan before the foundation of the world. And that plan was because he so loves us that he wanted to send his son to die for us, to pay the price for our sin. And that's what God was going to do. He was going to set us free from the sin, from the, the penalty of our sin. And John 1 verse 29 we see John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that is what Jesus came to do, to take away the sin of the world. And then in Romans 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So we have been given a gift. Folks, what did we deserve? What were our wages? What were we, should we have been paid for? Our sin. But by the mercy and the grace of God and by the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, he paid that debt for us, didn't he? And so what we have is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's what we have been given. And you know, folks, God draws us. I said that in the very beginning. We're here because God draws us. You know what? God created us with a longing, a deep, deep inner need. And you know what? It's a need to worship. And you can try and fill that need with anything. You can try to fill it with possessions. You can try to fill it with um, pleasures. You can try and fill it with whatever you have, success, um, abilities, whatever it is. But you know what, guys? It doesn't matter what you try to do. There is only one thing that can fill that inner longing, that inner need is that was in every one of us. You see in all these other religions, they all worship something, don't they? The, um, very often it's even just a statue that they're worshipping an idol. We worship, but we worship a living God who fills the hollow in our hearts and in our lives and is working in our hearts and our lives to draw us closer to him. Okay, um, John 6 verse 44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up at the last day. So folks, it's God who draws us. And once we are drawn, then we either respond or we don't respond. We either say yes or we say no. That's up to us. And then we come, when we come to Jesus, the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And we realize that we are in need of a savior, that we are sinners. Before that, I knew I wasn't a sinner. I was a pretty good guy until I realized that I needed a savior and that I was a sinner. And I think that for most of us is exactly the same thing. So what do we do? We repent of our sin. So what is repentance? Repentance is a 180 degree turn. It's turning from unrighteousness to righteousness. It's turning from my path to God's path. It's turning from wickedness to righteousness. It's turning totally around, folks. You cannot be saved and continue to walk in the same path as you were walking. You cannot continue to do the things you once did. If you do, then do you have the Spirit of God living within you? Because we cannot, cannot stay the same if we truly are saved. If we truly have a relationship with Jesus Christ, how can we then continue to walk in the ways of the world? We cannot do that, folks. Um, in 1 John 1 verse 9, we're told if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to forgive us from all unrighteousness. In Romans 10 verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the question is, folks, have you done this? 
Have you recognized your need of a savior? Have you confessed your sins? He is faithful and just. He will forgive us. But not only will he forgive us, but he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have you confessed him with your mouth that Jesus is Lord? Have you proclaimed it? Have you believed in your heart that Jesus is Lord? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves. If we're truly saved, folks, this is what we need to know. These are the things, these are the signs of salvation. And when we come to Jesus, oh, we're now born again of the Spirit of God, and we are children of God. Okay, sanctification. We're going on to the second point. And folks, you know what? Now that we are saved, there's a process of sanctification that begins. We are not immediately made holy. We're not saved today and tomorrow we're okay. There's a walk, there's a road, there's a race that we have to run. There's a finishing post that we have to get to. <clears throat> and you know what? <clears throat> it's a work of sanctification that begins in our hearts. And sanctification means to be set apart. And we read in 1 Peter 1 verse 15 to 16, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy as I am holy. And folks, holiness doesn't mean without any flaw. It means mature. It means complete. It means being set apart. It's a process. We're not there yet. We're on our way. But we are called holy because we are all being made holy. And this is what we need to remember. It's a work of God through the Holy Spirit. It's in us. Each person who comes to salvation, who has received Jesus as their Savior, has the indwelling Holy Spirit. You're not alone. God is with you now and always. God is with us. And we need to remember that we have the indwelling Holy Spirit who dwells within each and every one of us. In John 17, verse 4, uh, 2 Corinthians 17, 6, verse 17 to 18 first. God has set us apart from the world, but in doing that, he set us apart unto him. And in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17 to 18, therefore come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And in John 17, verse 14 to 16, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. You know, folks, the word of God is true. And it's by the word of God, by knowing the word of God, by living the word of God, by applying the word of God, Jesus is the word of God. And it's by that, folks, that we will come to the knowledge of the truth. And how can you know the difference between the true and the false unless you know the true? You need to study the true to be able to see the false. Otherwise, you will very easily be led astray. You know what Mother Teresa said? Our progress and holiness depends on God and ourselves, on God's grace and our will to be holy. Do you will to be holy? That is the question. You know, folks, a couple of weeks ago, Des uh, spoke and he spoke about the talents and about how we've all got talents and we all need to use our talents to the glory of God. Are we multiplying our talents? Are we using them or are we bearing them? Because one thing, one day at the judgment seat of God, I would like to stand there and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. I would hate to hear the words away from me, I do not know you. And if we are bearing our talents, then perhaps we are not going to hear those words. And I know that's my desire, and I pray it's yours as well. Um, okay. We have been reconciled to God through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Guys, reconciled means that we were at enmity with God. We have been brought back into a friendship, into fellowship with God. We have been reconciled. We have come back to him through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the cross, through the crucifixion. And we are no longer our own. We now belong to God. And in 1 Peter 2 verse 9, we're told that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light, oh, that we would declare the praises of God. 
And you know what, folks, we have been given so much. And now we are accountable and we are responsible to God for all he has done and all he is doing. It is God's work, God that is working in our hearts and in our lives, folks. And 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 11, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. We once were, we are no longer. We have been washed. We have been sanctified. Hmm. My internet connection is unstable. Okay, that's why I've got my notes. <laughs> Sorry, guys. But this is, this is a, there's a false gospel that's being taught today. Isn't that so, folks? And it's a, bless, a, a life of blessing, of prosperity, of perfect health. I think nothing's ever going to go wrong in your life. Come to Christ, be saved, say a sinner's prayer, and you're okay. And you can live your life any way you want to. That's a lie, isn't it? Did God ever promise us that? Did he ever promise us a life of ease? No, he did not. He promised us that there would be affliction, that there would be persecution. And we see and um, uh, we see in 2 Timothy 2 verse 20 to 21. Folks, we are be formed into a mess of our master's use. You know what? He's chiseling away parts of us all the time. It's like being in the potter's mold and being in the refiner's fire. He's busy molding and making and changing. And it's a painful process sometimes. But in 2 Timothy 2 verse 20 to 21. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes and some for ignoble. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. You know what, folks? We have a part to play. If we cleanse ourselves from the ignoble, this is what it says. We have to do part of it, don't we? God is doing the work in our hearts. But guys, we have to be participants, willing participants. So persecution. Paul warns that there will be persecution in the lives of the believers. And in 2 Timothy 2, 3 verse 12, he says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And folks, we see in the lives of the apostles how they suffered for their faith, isn't that so? They were hated, they were persecuted, and eventually nearly all of them, I believe all excepting John, were, were actually martyred for their faith. And I'm open to correction, but that's what I understand. But we see Paul's persecution. You know, Jesus appeared to Saul, to Paul on the road to Damascus, and a bright light shone, and Paul was knocked off his horse, and then he was blind, or his mule, whatever. And then he was blind, wasn't he? And God spoke to Ananias. And, you know, Paul had been given letters to persecute the church. So obviously, Ananias, when he was told to go and pray for Paul, he was petrified. And so what did he do? He listened to God. And God spoke to him, and this is what God said. Jesus said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And oh, guys, we see how Paul suffered. We're busy doing the book of 2 Corinthians. And in that, we have a list of some of the persecutions of Paul, even more if you go to chapter 11. But I've just brought out a few, and I'm going to read this portion. In 2 Corinthians 6, verse 3 to 5, we put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way in great endurance in troubles, hardships and distresses, in beatings, imprisonments and riots, in hard work, sleepless nights and hunger, a few of his persecutions. And then in verse eight to 10, through glory and honor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as imposters, known and yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet not killed, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, 
having nothing and yet possessing everything. Folks, listen to those last words of Paul. What does he say? Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, rejoicing in his sorrow. Poor, yet making many rich. Did they have physical riches? No, they did not. They were making them rich with the word of God by sharing the mystery of the word of God and then having nothing and yet possessing everything. You know, when we possess Jesus Christ, he's all we need. We don't need anything else. That's what the truth is, guys. Okay. Uh, okay. Charles Colson said, unquestioning acceptance and obedience are the foundation of the Christian life. Unquestioning acceptance and obedience are the foundation of the Christian life. But he also said our goal as believers is to seek to please God, not what he can do for us. Personal victories may come, but they are a result, not the object. True Christian maturity, holiness, sanctification is God-centered. Is that what we desire, folks? And you know, Charles Spurgeon said, to be sanctified in your spirit, soul, and body should be our aim. I know that that is my aim, and it certainly was the aim of the uh, um, persecuted believers. We see this. It's what we see in the life of Paul and the other apostles. Folks, can you say that? Will you say that? That our spirit, soul, and body, to be sanctified in our spirit, soul, and body, is that your aim? If it's not, then go back and question your Christianity, question your relationship with God, because that should be our aim, to be sanctified, to be made holy. Trials and testing, you know, as believers, we know that we're going to go through trials and testing. In James 1 verse 2 to 4, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Guys, we're not running a 100 meter sprint, we're running a marathon. And you know what, to finish the race, we need perseverance, we need endurance, we need stick at it ability. And that's what we need to be doing, is persevering to finish the race that has been set before us. It's through perseverance that we become mature and that we become complete. And that is holiness, folks. And it's only through that perseverance. You know, when we surrender our lives to God, we need to know God is sovereign. And when we allow him to take control of all of our lives, we need to allow him to guide us and to lead us, to protect us, to shape us, to mold us. We need to give over to God and surrender our lives and trust that God does know what he's doing. Because you know what? There's nothing that takes God by surprise. There's nothing that he does not know. He doesn't wake up one morning, and I've said this before, and suddenly say, oops, what happened last night? Because God knows what's happening all the time. He is sovereign. He is in control. And it is through the Holy Spirit that we can live lives that are pleasing to God, lives of obedience and surrender, lives of holiness. It's not us on our own. It's going to be through the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews 12, verse 14, again, partly our part, make every effort, take note, to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. If we are not made holy, folks, we will not see the Lord. And then what about spiritual roots? You know, the more time you spend with God, the more time you spend in prayer, in meditation, in listening to God, speaking with God, not speaking to God, not coming with just a grocery list, but listening to God. And the more time we do that, that we spend special time with God, the more time we will want to spend with God, the deeper our love will become. And the more we will want to be led by God and surrender our lives, and we will put down roots. And you know what? The deeper our roots go, the stronger our faith will grow. I've been in Black Panther Assemblies for a long time now. But you know what, guys? This is my spiritual home. And I've put down roots. And I pray that my roots in Black Panther Assemblies of God are, 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 of God are deep. But I pray that my roots in God are even deeper. You know, if the roots of a tree are deep, that tree will stand strong through every storm. But if the roots are shallow, you'll be blown over very, very easily. The tree will not stand. In Jeremiah 17, verse 7 to 8, but blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. 
It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit will then begin to be evident in our lives, folks. And we know what the fruit of the Holy Spirit is. In Galatians 5, verse 22 to 24, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature. Have you crucified the sinful nature? Are you in the process of crucifying the sinful nature? And you know what? As we do this, as we spend time with God, as we study his word and meditate on his word, we will grow in spiritual wisdom and in understanding. And we will begin to reflect Christ's likeness in our life. And folks, now we are prepared to serve. If we have been sanctified and we are walking in obedience to God, we have also been prepared to serve. God has been doing a working in our hearts and our lives, and we should be using our talents to glorify God and to serve him and to serve others. We've been cleansed. We have been sanctified unto good works. We don't become holy. We don't come to God holy. We come to God with all our filthy rags in our unrighteousness, and he, in the process of sanctifying us, makes us holy. In Ephesians 2 verse 10, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The works that we do are the works that God has prepared for us to do, and he has given us everything we need to complete his work. We see that in 2 Peter 1 verse 3. His divine power has given, given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. And in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58, it tells us to always give ourselves fully to the work of the Lord because we know that our labor for the Lord is not in vain. Nothing we do to serve God and to serve others will ever be in vain. And you know what, folks, we are stewards of God. I, and you know what, we all have called to be stewards, but are we wise stewards? Are we stewards of our family, of our home, of our jobs? Are we wise stewards? And you know what, God has entrusted his mysteries to us. And we see in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1, this is the way that any person is to regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. You know what, God reveals his mysteries to his faithful servants. Are we faithful servants? Has he revealed mysteries to us? You know, some of the hidden things are God's. He doesn't tell us everything. He tells us what he can trust us with, but he will only entrust to faithful stewards the mysteries of God. But now that we have been given so much, folks, we also have an awesome responsibility, haven't we? We are responsible for what we have been given. And Jesus' last command to his disciples, we see in all the Gospels, I'm going to be reading just in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. This is a commission to each and every one of us. It doesn't say go and make converts. And folks, yes, we need to make converts, but beyond the converts, we need to make disciples. We need to disciple those that are converts, and we need to teach them to obey what God has commanded. How can we do that if we do not know God's word? How important is it for us to dig into God's word? You know, Timothy says that we must be diligent to accurately handle the word of truth. That's what we need to do. And so we need to be obedient to what God has called us to do. Are we fulfilling this? And you know, this, I've put here God's commands. It's actually instructions more than commands. But in this one little passage of scripture, there's just so much that we are told to do. First of all, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without rumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others. 
faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. So, folks, there were a number of instructions in this. First of all, we're told to pray. We're also told to love deeply. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, pray continually. We're told to pray without ceasing. You know, folks, in, uh, the first commandment is to love. And we know that when Jesus was tested by a lawyer and he was asked what the greatest commandment was, this was his answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do we do that? Do we love deeply? You know, it's not even our own love. God has poured his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. And then in hospitality. And there is no greater example of hospitality, I do not believe, than the early church in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. It's a long passage, but I am going to read it all. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. We have done that today, folks, haven't we? We are fellowshipping. We have broken bread. We have prayed and will continue to pray. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to everyone as they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We live in a different world. We can't do all the things that they once did. But folks, we can love deeply. We can pray. We can offer hospitality to one another. These are commands that God has given us. You know, in James 1 verse 27, we see what God calls pure religion. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And in Proverbs 28 verse 27, he who gives to the poor will lack nothing, but he who closes his eyes to them receives many curses. Over and over in the word of God, we see the awesome responsibility is, uh, that is ours to see that the brothers within the body of Christ, our brothers and sisters, that there are none that are needy, that we care for one another, that we look after one another. May we be faithful to do this, folks. We are God's hands and feet. We are his body. This is what we are supposed to be doing. And then in Romans 12, verse 12 to 13, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, share with God's people who are in need, practice hospitality. That's what we are told to do. And you know, folks, Jesus came as a servant. He came to serve, not to be served. Isn't that so? And we are to follow the example that he set. You know, in John chapter 13, when Jesus broke bread with his disciples on the night he was going to be betrayed, what always caught me, and I actually went back in the very beginning and just rechecked, because Jesus even washed the feet of Judas, the one who was to betray him just later. When we are told to love our enemies, folks, would we do that? Would we wash the feet of our enemies? Because that's what Jesus did. And he's our example. And then we see in John 13, verse 14, 15, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set before you an example that you should do as I have done for you. An example of servanthood. It's not literally getting down and washing everyone's feet necessarily, folks. It's symbolic. But it is about serving one another in total humility. And then we see in Philippians 2, verse 5 to 7, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And he says that is what our attitude should be, folks, the attitude of humility and attitude of obedience. And you know, folks, we are saved and sanctified 
unto good works, unto good deeds. And in Matthew 5, verse 16, we're told in the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Not praise you, praise your Father in heaven. Our good deeds should bring praise to God. He should be glorified by everything we do. And you know, folks, it is all glory to God. God is to be given all the glory, all the honor, all the praise, all the worship, all the adoration. We worship him in spirit and truth. And you know, when we walk by the spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We will be able to walk in that holiness that will be the desire of our hearts. We have been saved, folks. We are being sanctified and we are servants of the Lord. That's my message. Let us pray. Father, today I do just thank you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the free gift of salvation that you have given to each and every one of us. We thank you that we know that we are being sanctified. And oh, Father, we pray that we will be part of that, that we will in all things, Father, do that that you desire us to do, that we will use our talents to glorify you, that we will persevere to the finishing post, that we will serve you, that we will serve others, that we will emanate your love and that we will, Father, more and more day by day be changed to be Christ-like into the Christ-likeness of Christ our Saviour. I ask in Jesus' name and I say thank you, my God. Amen.